Hello and welcome to the Sound on Sound podcast about electronic music and all things synth. I'm Caro C and in this episode we're talking to Graham Massey here in Manchester, England. Graham is probably best known for the pioneering work of 808 State, who took the energy of the early UK rave scene into the pop charts with several top 10 singles and albums in the 1990s. Eight Hundred Eight State returned to international touring in 2018 to celebrate their 30th anniversary with the release of the album Transmission Suite in 2019. Graham has also worked as a producer and remixer for diverse key figures like Bjork, Quincy Jones, David Bowie, The Stone Roses, Gold Frapp, and Yellow Magic Orchestra. Graham's worked as a composer on film soundtracks, music for commercials, theatre pieces, public art events, and he's also the leader of a number of other musical projects in the city of Manchester, which you'll hear about shortly. To get us started, here's a snippet of Pacific, an 808 state classic track which was released in 1989. Well, for the first time, um, I'm doing a podcast in person, and <laughs> today I'm joined by Graham Massey. Yes, next to the radiator in the kitchen. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> the cosy way to do podcasts is the future. Of course, we're both based in Manchester, UK, hence why we could um, meet as we Almost were Almost the... the same postcode. Yes, so that, that's good, exactly. Isn't it? Yeah. Brilliant. Um, yeah, I guess we're going to have to start with the timeline and the music that most people will know you for, which is 808 State. So yeah. Obviously, our passion is the gear and your creative processes. So I wonder how it all began. And For, for me, my personal journey to 808 State was... Uh, engineering course at a place called School of Sound Recording in Manchester. It was one of the first um, music engineering courses in, I was going to say the country, but I think it's actually one of the first in the world in a way. There were no particular institutions around in in the, this will be the mid 80s. And uh, it was a time where the first Atari computers were coming in. I remember the day it arrived and it was almost like a 2001 moment where we sort of like crouched around it and threw bones into the air, you know, it was like nobody knew how to even turn it on, Uh, no one could teach you it because it was, you just had to get the book out and get stuck into it, you know, and uh, it opened up a whole world of possibilities because previously to that sequencing and sampling, you know, it was a bit of an ad hoc expensive situation you know if you weren't in in a college situation you know to gather that equipment and and have a knowledge of that equipment there were certain people in Manchester who um had delved into it you know New Order for instance you know I remember seeing New Order's equipment with different bands they used to uh, lend that equipment out to um there was a various bands I'm thinking of one called Tot and like small gigs in in Manchester where it's like why have they got a fair light, you know? And it was like, oh, it's, they've lent it off New Order. Or what. They were very generous in sharing that enthusiasm for the early technology. But, yeah, I'm trying to think where drum machines and sequences lived back then in the 80s in, in Manchester, in, in, in the, the, the village-like atmosphere of the music industry in Manchester. And I, I do remember uh, one guy, um, John Hurst, who was like an apprentice of Martin Hannon and his flat, which uh, he shared with the drummer from our band at the time, a guy called Phil Kirby from Biting Tongues. They had this uh, amazing flat that was full of things like ARP 2600 and all the rolling gear from like the 808, the 303, uh, the 101s. And this was probably about 83, 84. So were they still as expensive in relation to the cost of everything yeah, else? Yeah, they were time? rare. Right. You know, I, I, you didn't see, see them all, everywhere. You know, the, you had to have a lot, a, a bit of knowledge about how to plug them all together. And 
But that's when you first started hearing those familiar sounds, you know. And the music that they were playing, for instance, I think John Hurst had some involvement in Section 25's Looking from a Hillside, you know, the, which is like often quoted as one of the first uses of a 303, one of the first popular uses. So he was our sound engineer at the time and he'd do little solo gigs as a support slot to, to us when we're doing little gigs in Manchester. He was called Yak Boy. <laughs> and it was like, you know, a one-man show with rolling equipment. So fast forward into, um, you know, 87, 86, 87. And when a group of us got together via the Eastern Block record shop. That was there back then? Yeah. Eastern Block started as um, a record stall in Affleck's Palace, you know, and then it got its own shop. I ran a cafe across the road from this shop. And uh, consequently, all the record shop people used to come in. And it was, it was uh, I used to play all kinds of weird music down there. So it was a music-centred cafe. In fact, uh, John Peel used to come and hold court in my cafe, you know, when he'd, he'd make regular trips up to Manchester and uh, connect with the record shops, Piccadilly Records and Eastern Block and many others. So he'd come and hold court. And, um, yeah, it was just this vibe of, the technology was mostly involved in hip hop records, really, you know, drum machines. And there was a lot of kids going into the record shop who were like groups of rappers and a little bit of equipment, you know, they'd have budget equipment. So when I first met a guy called Gerald and um, the Spin Masters, who later came into 808 State, they, you know, they had a, a hodgepodge of equipment. And we'd be doing hip hop gigs with this equipment. At the same time, the radio in Manchester there was a guy called Stu Allen who uh, died in recent months, actually. And the amount of tributes that came out for Stu Allen, he, he had such a, an effect on Northwest England in terms of uh, music culture. He brought in all the Detroit and Chicago music. As I say, he didn't bring it in, but he kind of broadcast it. Everyone walked around with the cassettes, you know, it was the era of the ghetto blaster. Yeah, I was going to say that. Were you already plugged into that international perspective or was it more of a thing that was happening locally that kind of became international, if you know what I mean? Um, no, I would say like the international influence took seed in Manchester is what I'm saying. You know, it, there, was a, there was a firm interest in American music and an outlet for it, which was local radio, not Radio One or any, anything like that, you know. So all these seeds took, you know, started growing into a more colloquial kind of music scene. Gerald was really ahead of the curve, you know. He he was uh, making his own tapes in, in his bedroom and getting getting them played on this radio show, the Stu Allen show. It was really based in the sort of youth club kind of scene in Manchester, which. Again, the Spin Masters were really part of that. They started DJing at the Salvation Army, actually, in, in Manchester. And you think, like, well, that doesn't sound very hip kind of thing. But those parties were, were big, you know. They were kind of, like, where it was at at that point, you know. The youth culture, you know, it was pre-drinking age, you know. So it was all boiling away there, you know. Yeah, so at that point, when I started this engineering course, we started funneling all the talent coming through the record shop into the studio from that point of view. And we took a real interest in Acid House because to me, Acid House talked to me more than a lot of the other music. You know, I love the alien quality of the music. The fact that it related more to the left field music that I'd grown up with. You know, everyone um, in the hip hop people didn't know who I, how I fitted in kind of thing. I was more from the post-punk generation and growing up making records for New Hormones records and Factory records. And I was an experimentalist, you know. So it was a, a collision of quite a few different personalities that started experimenting as 808 State. You know. So the first records we made were literally improvisations in, in the studio uh, over the course of a weekend. That first album we did, New Build, is limited on time because studio time was really expensive, you know. Um, I managed to sort of get the keys over, over the weekend and because I was doing like a caretaking role at the studio. So we, we snuck it in left, right and centre. But uh, that, that album was knocked out in a weekend, you know. Using? 
using the the rolling equipment at, at the time. You know, Gerald had the 808 and the 303. We had about three 101s between us. Wow. So we set all those going. We had um, some other bits of equipment. Like the Atari is on one track, an FZ1 sampler, um, which was a Casio, one of the first quality samplers that was under a thousand pounds. So that that was there. And then there was a really ancient sampler, um, an Akai uh, wall mounted thing where, with spaces for floppy disks. Someone's going to have to tell me what that is, but it was pre S900. And that had a trigger in mechanism. So you could send uh, the trigger out from the drum machine into that and you could alter the envelope of the sample at either end with with these sliders, you know. So that that is a real feature of that album. It's kind of a, it uh, gives it a real flavour. We had a Pearl Sing cushion unit as well, for instance. That was something that was left over from the post-punk days and that's all over it. Um, anything you could trigger, really. There was no, barely any MIDI involved in that album because we were on... A limited time you know it's just like what can we do quickly that's the flavor of that album we were just getting into it at that point yeah. And then how did things develop and get bigger, as it were? Yeah, as, uh, as you know, give it an, a few months after that. And equipment like the Roland D50 was coming in. It was a linear synthesis keyboard that you would recognise from every pop hit of the mid-80s. You know, from Madonna Records to Michael Jackson Records. And that was, that was interesting to us because you could actually start to use the, the the language of those pop records in your crazy mad acid music you know it kind of gave it a legitimacy a connection to the world of pop you know, kind of you familiar know. language yeah, in some way these yeah. textures and it's it's uh, it had a shortcut to a polished production sound you know they they came with reverbs and Ni- they're a very nylon-y kind of polished sound. Once we got that keyboard, we couldn't leave it alone. You know, we were putting it in everything. And, and when I listen back to 1989, 808 State material, it's like, I wish we'd been a bit more reserved with it. <laughs> you know, it's on everything, you know. And uh, there was another piece of Roland equipment then called the Roland R8 drum machine, uh, which went... Uh, in the opposite direction to analog drums, it was like it, sam- it used samples, but they were like now kind of um, better quality, and you could alter all the parameters of of them, tuning and uh, groove. It was a very sophisticated drum machine for its day, and uh, that flavors a lot of our material from '89 onwards. When you listen to 808 State Records now, it, there is layers and layers of drums. There's like 909s layered with R8 drum machines, 808s in there, samples. It, it's such a drum orchestra of uh, beats, you know. When people think of drum machines, they think of the space and the economy of boom, clack, boom, clack. But we took it in the opposite direction and got really into things like what you could do with the swings and the offsets of what we used back then was um, time code. So we were trying to get things to sound tight at times, which some of that equipment really helped with. Things like the 909s having a certain swing on them and the way din sync locked really a lot tighter than MIDI. And then I can hear periods uh, back in the early 90s where we struggled all the time to get tight grooves and almost went against trying to do it or almost giving up and going in the opposite direction of of going a bit free with it you know going a bit sloppy i listen to those things down they have an identity of the technology of that day as well how about the melodies and all the hooks 
I'm thinking Cubic, I'm thinking Pacific. Yeah, I mean, for an electronic band, it wasn't just about the sounds, you know, it was, there's still a lot of musicality. Say you take a handful of groups from back then, you know, uh, like LFO and Future Sound of London and stuff. I think, you know, we're way more into the kind of uh, musical side of things, you know, I mean, we didn't, we sort of overcompensated with, with the music sometimes, you know, which the doors of the day, you know, and we were talking originally, we were using a thing called, what's it called, hybrid art sympty track, which didn't encourage you to do uh, linear timelines. It was more like, like a loop based kind of thing, you know, it's like loops and loops and loops. Also, Steinberg Pro 24 was, was the standard door of the day. And that was similar. What was the forerunner of Logic? It was uh, C-Lap. Most of the other bands, techno bands of the early 90s, I seem to remember favouring C-Lap, you know, which um, would make you compose in a certain way. You know, it wasn't until uh, Pro Tools later in, uh, in, in the 90s that we, could, we started doing a much more timeline-based kind of music. The way we used to compose was sort of like having, filling a 24 track tape full of loops basically. And some of them would be eight bar loops, some of them would be two bar loops, some of them would be six bar loops. So they would all spiral around each other while you composed on the mute buttons. And one of the aspects of uh, being four of us in the band at one point is eight hands to operate the mixing desk. Yeah. Because we didn't use automated mixing desks back then, you know. So you had to have it in your brain. You had to have a map, really, you know. And, and what we used to do is lay, lay down sections and edit them together on tape. Yeah, kind of stitch them together afterwards, do the arrangement afterwards. Yeah, so so the, if you look back in, in like, I've got lots of notebooks of like these like diagrams of like <laughs> cut up. Um, sections and you know where where things would fit yeah so there's the composition was was going on but it, it was a, a real Heath Robinson kind of way of setting about it and that kind of fits with your whole improvisatory kind of background and really your centering within music yeah I would I'd say, I'd, I do since I was um, first playing music in my teens improvisation was the key thing for for a the group of musicians I grew up with, you know, we would think nothing of getting in a room and playing for like six hours and and not really trying to organise it. You know, it was it was about how can I say it's kind of like letting music flow through you. It sounds like it's come from a kind of hippie background, really, of like you know, cosmic music, kraut rocky kind of stuff. You know, it sounds like that kind of stream of consciousness kind of approach that. That yeah. idea when they talk about writing being like that. Yeah, it's nothing to do with chord structures and hitting the middle eight and that kind of thing. You know, I would say the the, the records we were listening to mostly in the seventies, things like Miles Davis seventies albums as as they emerged. What was fantastic about them was the fact that you could tell there was all this spontaneity in the music, but then there was a post production thing of editing. His producer, Teo Macero, used to take the raw tapes and then, almost like a dub reggae artist, apply the effects of the day and then arrange with his razor blade pieces of music that then made sense. You know, like, for instance, you take a track like In the Silent Way, where it's actually just, re it's, there's no shame in repeating a whole section again to make a composition. So that kind of thinking was definitely there when we're doing things like making those first 808 state records, you know. And I think the technology, especially the hardware, kind of the sequencing hardware, the drum machines especially, yeah. sort of lend themselves to that, don't they? Because you sort of try things out and then you're like, it might have some happy accidents in there. Yeah. I mean, I really love the the sort of dumbness of of some of those early acid records or the house records that were just insanely repetitive that was great for a while there's a number of our records that will do that but to get a great vibe and leave it going i think our attention span and, and again because it was like three of uh, three or four of us in the room 
it's not about one person's attention span, it's about a group attention span, meant that these records splintered all over the place and, and became, um, took some weird turns, you know. Yeah, and so how did all that translate to live then in terms of, you know, what kit you could take on the road and what, what worked and how much of it could be truly well, the, live? Well, the first concerts we did were basically a tabletop full of din sync and trigger we didn't bother with a computer at first, you know, we just had a tabletop full of uh, compatible equipment. And then we didn't have a set list. We just started going, you know. And th there's some tapes uh, knocking about on the internet of, of that stuff. And there's an album called Pre-Build that we released through Reflex Records in the early 2000s that has some early improv stuff of that material. And you can just you can just hear it organically unfolding, you yeah. know. Yeah, that that that's how we did it live in the, when we were doing all the warehouse parties of the late eighties. And some, yeah, it was a bit hit and miss. You know? <laughs> Me and Gerald, in more recent times, have done a thing called rebuild, where we've done exactly the same thing, where you just set up a tabletop full of gear and jump off a cliff with it, you know. And it's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. And yet within, you know, you're going to play for, say, an hour and a half or something. And there's moments where you go in this, you know, s s moments where it's just not working and then moments where it all just emerges out of the darkness and it, it, that's a fabulous feeling, you know. It's like, it's back to that improvising thing, you know. Yeah, and of taking just, the audience with you. Just letting music come through you yeah. And, yeah. and responding to the moment and trying not to panic and then trying to think on, uh, on the fly and all your experience of the technology comes into it. You know, That's how we started doing it until we've had some pop hits and then we had to sort of rearrange it to the point where you're representing... Um, a record, you know, that's that's the way it's been a, a lot of the time, you know, where you're representing a back catalogue and that kind of thing, you know. Yeah. But I would still say that I would still do quite a lot of improvised electronics. For many years, I've done it under the name Masonics. For instance, I went on uh, an American tour with uh, Orteca back in the 2000s, where their stipulation was like, you've just got to improvise every night, you know, not no tunes you know that was really exciting and then I've carried on that project for over many years you know just sort of uh, doing spontaneous electronic stuff but once a to eight state becomes this kind of uh, what's the word a brand almost you know we also do those gigs that are you know when you've got to get on at a festival and you've got a 20 minute changeover and they won't let you have a sound check it's another matter you know it's uh, you know that's a different show you know but we've made that show almost a bit more musician-y in that we use a drummer and I play a lot of sax and guitar in, in 808 now. I'm bringing the improvisation into that, which we've actually always done that. And particularly when we first used to go on these big tours around America and stuff, in that you can't do the same thing every night. You know, you go crazy, you know. So so we built improvisation in, into that set and sometimes people appreciate it and but you know a lot of electronic purists wonder why we do have a drummer and that kind of thing but i've stuck to my guns on that one it's about human energy for me you know especially in that s situation you know but i've done all, all kinds of formats of 808 over the years yeah in recent times i went and did a, a tour around germany where of just the tabletop version of some of the tracks you can't from the back catalog that you, that suit a tabletop situation you know so that that was uh, refreshing to me to be able to address some of the some of the album tracks that rely on more fiddly not twiddly business you know. Yeah, peppered my timeline as an electronic musician, but also just as someone being at festivals and clubs and being interested in electronic music and electronic dance music. I was talking to someone recently who's a drum and bass junglist, and he yeah. mentioned you as part of that kind of roots of a lot of stuff that, that became drum and bass and jungle. So there, there was, as you say, all those seeds were being planted and sprouted. Yeah, I mean, it was a, the early 90s was exceptionally exciting in terms of genre bending of of music you know it was like every week there was like unique records you know this developments in music you were never short of inspiration because it, it was all like a feedback system of like every everyone in i was going to say the country but it's the world you know it was all feeding back on itself and 
addressing the same issues really you know of like moving this music on so yeah i think you know some of our early tracks did um I'm trying to remember the name of the club where a lot of drum and bass came out of rage you know tracks like cubic were big at rage uh you wouldn't say that was a drum and bass track but it's the break beaty aspect of uh some of the tr some of the tracks that we did and the i remember doing tracks early on that use sub bass uh we got a instrument called the JD 800, uh, another Roland synth, where one of the presets was just an 808 kick drum that you could then spread over the keyboard and apply portmento and distortion to. And it's like the minute we got that keyboard, we started doing that. And then a couple of years later, it was everywhere. <laughs> you know, I'm not saying we invented it, but it, I remember it being a thing of like, I've got to use that again, you know, because... Uh, it, it just the bottom end it gave to records this it, again this kind of elastic quality to to the um, and the sub you know fantastic 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 so would you confess to being a synth collector or would you say it's just been more about you've collected things along the way? These days in the world of Instagram and where you people show off their synth collections, I'm I'm a lightweight, you know. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think so, you know. I'm I've not got into modular, for instance, you right. know. And I still have that attitude of like I'll use a piece of cheap gear. The last record we did, uh, Transmission Suite, it, it was a lot of, you know, a lot of the kind of Roland era stuff that was coming out at the time. I wasn't afraid of using that, and there was a lot of sort of flack about it at the time, you know. Well, people got to remember that, you know, th uh, things like the original 303 and the 808 were derided in their day as well, you know. So it's more important the speed of your ideas and when you can execute them. Uh, I think some of the equipment now is just getting, um, you know, you you don't want to spend like four hours of your day doing a patch, you know. You can do that later, you know, you can do, it's just getting the ideas down and then decorating. That's kind of what I do. I work, work in the box mostly and then farm it out to, for particular analog sounds later down the line, you know, at the mixing stage. And I don't know, I don't have a regular method of working you know a new piece of equipment to me and again that can apply to some cheap synth you know as so long as something sparks an idea that's the most important thing really you know and for you have there been with 808 say and beyond in terms of have there been those constant companions those constant tools yeah yeah i mean you can't like something like a mini moog has been it's an essential <laughs> part of my kit I would say I'm, I'm using that less as as the as getting older and older and less reliable, because some of the emulations are getting up to standard now. You know, one of my favourite instruments of recent times is the Roland TRAS, which I think is an amazing drum machine. Uh, really flexible, really creative. In in the past, you used to have to sort of um, do passes of drum machines, and you know you couldn't do everything on the fly like you can now so that that's i'm almost quite obsessed with that instrument it's it's uh opened up a, a new world particularly in remixes and stuff you know and um, how you can mutate beats and get into a whole new area of beats on it yeah and then in terms of like was there any moments you can think of that you're like oh when this arrived and made our lives so much easier or better or richer yeah as, as i was saying before i think when i first bought my first pro tools rig the ability to move huge bits of data around on mass and and start developing the thing that I'd done with editing in an accurate way that changed the music we made. You know, the the first album I would say where you can hear that is Don Solaris that we did in 1996. It's a different kind of music that, and that is based on simply that Pro Tools coming out at that point. 
Um, and obviously the laptop thing, you know, it's taken a few years to get that to the point where the idea of what a laptop could do and what it could actually do was, uh, it, 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 there was a slow, painful process uh, originally. I think I must have got my first one at the end of the 90s. And uh, I could only basically do MIDI off it. But now I could just have that one piece of equipment and do everything. Yeah, that's the most important piece of equipment in the armory, really. Mm. I wonder if you have any thoughts or feelings on sort of where the electronic music ecosystem's at, whether it's local or your, you know, your own networks, yeah. or, but also in terms of the technology and the music. Where do you feel we're at now? I, I think the, the primary difference between what we were doing back then in terms of making electronic music in a city and affecting a city. Because not only did we were we doing gigs and making records, but uh, they had the 808 radio show that we had, which was very influential on our city and, and the Northwest in terms of a delivery system. And uh, there was an article yesterday that I was reading on the internet about how the working class are getting shut out of the arts in terms of like you know any kind of music making sort of situation that requires time what we did have at the end of the 80s was a lot of people on the dole <laughs> it, was, it was kind of easy to be on the benefit system back then i think i must have been on the dole for about eight years or something you get your housing benefit but i went to the university of music in terms of just playing and playing and playing with people it's kind of you were subsidized in a way weren't you for that incubation yeah. kind of period and they say it's the same as a if you want to be a professional climber if you want to be an mp all these things yeah. they take time to get to that point where you can actually say right i am this yeah and, and a sort of lack of identity created a search for identity that was really quite intense it's like i'm worthless or am i worth something, do you know what I mean? That often comes from working class backgrounds of like why many footballers are from working class backgrounds and things. You know, it's, it's an interesting situation we find ourselves in now that there is a lot more art in the world in terms of people having access to equipment and stuff. But the people they, uh, who are making it and who are they making it for has shifted. There was nothing like the, f the feeling in Britain when rave first happened it was insanely kind of communal. You, it felt like the, one of the main things about rave is the way the country connected up over those parties. So uh, once upon a time, you didn't know anyone from Glasgow. And all of a sudden, the Glasgow people knew the Manchester people who knew the Birmingham people. And it was a social um, boundaries that were very intact in, in the mid 80s kind of thing. You know, they all blurred and melted into uh, a much more cohesive version of Britain uh, and the world, you know. So I remember, you know, going abroad for the first time. Well, I mean, I'd never been out of the country until I was like 30, you know, and first going over to places like Ibiza and meeting people from around the world with the, the commonality of that music. It develops an optimism in you as to how, how to live your life better, you know, which this current version of the Britain that we're, we're living in is completely the opposite of that, you know, which is just survive, you know. Mm, and back to separation and back to division. Yeah. And those stories need telling, I think, you know. And those environments need promoting. So I think, you know, I remember personally, it was the first time I felt safe on a dance floor. No one was going to bother you or yeah. you know, and things like that. Yeah, you from know. a sort of sexual politics kind of thing. It was like the culture that lived before it was like medieval. <laughs> you know? I think that has endured in terms of dance music and club culture in that sense, you know, in terms of more electronic music club yeah. culture I'm talking about. So now we, we have an electronic music culture that is hobbyist in a way you know that's one side that's developed through accessibility and the lowering of cost of the equipment there's a massive hobbyist kind of area of electronic music that doesn't have a home you know it doesn't have a social place you know so that that everything is, like boundaries are coming back in almost you know whereas I, lo I love the fact that you've got the weirdest records in the most popularist places you know I love the fact that, you know, 808 State Records 
were on Radio 1 in the daytime, on builders' radios. We didn't compromise the uh, experimental nature of music. And yet people are open to that if you put it in front of them, you know. The gatekeepers for me are, are kind of, things are changing because like, you know, there's so many portals to music now. And um, the the gatekeepers aren't as sort of strict as they as they used to be, but there's no cohesion in terms of like, you know, uh, and this is like, like as a personal perspective, it's like now I'm sort of in the 60s now, you know, so this, I'm not going to have the same perspective on it, you know, but. I feel very blessed to have like you know ridden that initial wave of like not just the electronic music revolution, but what that revolution was for, which is social cohesion and change. You know, that was amazing to be part of that conversation. Definitely, yeah. And of course, you've had lots of other projects aside from yeah. 808. So let's delve into some of those. I mean, ones yeah. I know of, Sisters with Transistors. You've got Tool Shed. Writing tongues, all Home sorts. Life. So in terms of kind of gear and musicality and processes, creative processes, um, yeah, let's hear yeah. a bit about those. I've always had an attitude in music making as to just use anything that's in the room. Um, my first group was uh, Biting Tongues, uh, who were on um, New Hormones and Factory. It was a, a post-punk group, but we, uh, it, you were encouraged by the attitudes of the day to be non and the non-musician was okay you know all that thing that came out of you know Eno not being a musician and every post-punk group in Manchester had a, a bleating trumpet in it for instance you know pick up any instrument and make noise you know was the playground of that and using a lot of music concrete techniques you know like just using cassette players and I mean, we, I think we kind of got that through bands like um, Can and Gong growing up in the 70s, where they would use tape recorders as part of the orchestra, you know. So that was where I started. And then Sisters with Transistors, for instance, was, it was a result of eBay, basically. I used to like old transistor organs, and you could pick them up so cheap. And you just pick them for their prettiness, really, sometimes. <laughs> They're just lovely objects. But then once you've got about eight of them, you get into the differences of this dying kind of culture of organs. And we formed a group uh, based on my friend uh, Mandy Wigby, uh, Henrietta Smith Roller, who's now Afro Deutsch. She was learning the keyboards at the time. Uh, Ragnar yeah. and Naomi uh, were piano teachers in the neighborhood. They were teaching all the kids in the neighbourhood uh, uh, piano. So we, we formed this group, uh, an organ quartet. And I think the idea probably came from the Steve Reich album with, where they got four organs on the cover, you know. I think that's just the, the initial sparking point of like, oh, let's do a group like that. And that, was that a nightmare to get them in tune and keep them in tune? It was a nightmare to, to get to a gig and them all to work. So sometimes we did take a spare one each, you know. And we used synth in the bass end, so um, there was a lot of weight in that. You know, it was, a, it was a van full. But writing that music, you had to write very almost Baroque kind of music because you're dealing with, like, uh, single lines weaving around each other. And you, you end up with a very ornate Baroque kind of sound. Uh, but we wanted to be like a disco band, really, you know. So there's a little bit of ABBA to it as well at the same time. It was a great, fun project and a relief to have these parameters of, like, just write to this equipment rather than write expansively with no boundaries and a Chinese menu of VSTs or whatever. Yeah, yeah, those limitations. Yeah, look, I love some limitations, yeah. As, as I spoke before, the Masonics project is about doing a more esoteric version of electronic music for me and largely again, about doing live gigs with, with it. Toolshed is my jazz project. Well, I say my jazz project, it's not really. It, it, it's, again, about improvising and having some amazing players from, from Manchester. A lot of them came from Matt and Fred's Jazz Club, you know, so some of the drummers are really versed in jazz and imp improvisation. 
It actually started off as a, a, a techno night at the night and day cafe in Manchester. They wanted me to do a DJ thing every month. And I just started using it as a platform for writing on the laptop and then using real musicians in, in that context. So sometimes we'd end up with four drummers and, and drum loops. <laughs> it, again, it was like an, an exercise in density and great soloists. You know, we had um, people like uh, Graham Clark, who was an improvising violin player. It used to be in the band Gong. And saxophone player called Sam Healy, who was just amazing. You know, a lot of young talent that came through the colleges in Manchester, like uh, Royal Northern College of Music and Salford University, where they have great music courses. So it, it was a platform to get together different skill sets, but with old attitudes. I, I find that, you know, I'm not nearly skilled on those kind of levels, but mixing those different kind of age groups and backgrounds is where you get real gold, you know, mixing different disciplines together, you know. So at one point we had the 28 piece big band version of Toolshed back in the days of funding. And um, that was uh, a life changing experience. That was, that was awesome. You know? um, but we, can, we continue to do Toolshed. Sometimes we do it as a trio. Sometimes we do it as like eight people. Depends who's around and uh, we did one just before Christmas, actually, at this amazing pub in Todmorden called The Golden Lion. Anyone in the DJ scene will know The Golden Lion. It's like where Andy Weatherall used to tip up, you know, four or five times a year and do amazing sets. And there's these little cultural hubs uh, around the Northwest where new music is allowed to flourish, you know. So uh, we play those kind of places, you know. And w where are you at in terms of your own music? What you know, what excites you? What excites you nowadays in terms of you know the magic of music generally, but also in what you want to create? Yeah, I'm at a point now where um, I've had a bit of a break. You know, since uh, Andrew died, uh, who was Andrew Barker, who was in 808 State. Obviously, now I'm the only member left. We used to be four members. You know, <laughs> gradually one by one, I'm I'm, I'm now a singular item. So. I need to think about collaborations, really, you know, in terms of to make a new record. That's where my head's at. I'm, I'm looking into uh, collaborations and um, trying to kind of honour the whole 30-odd years of 808. You know, when we're doing gigs now, you're kind of trying to make a track that fits in that set. is quite difficult. You either have to destroy the whole thing which when you look at artists who changed all the time, back to Miles Davis, you know, he'd have to trash everything, you know, left, right and centre at times, you know. His band changed all the time, you know, so. And I can see why, I can really understand why, you know, because you can't fit 30 years of music into a set easily. So um, it's a matter of momentum a lot of the time. Back when we used to make uh, those albums for ZTT, you know, we were we had a record contract and a funding system and all those great studios of the day. That studio uh, culture is growing again, I think. You know, it's like, that, particularly in Manchester, there's quite a few people who've invested in a nice environment and equipment to do recording again. I'd like to get back into one of those situations, a more formal recording situation. Uh, the last record we made, we hired um, the old TV station, uh, Granada TV, had uh, the, the old control room at Granada TV was our base. where well, we could lay out all my synths everywhere. It felt like an amazing environment, but we it was on limited time. It's now been made into a hotel. So, um, I want to not put down roots and make build a brand new studio. What I want to do is write and then go into a more formal recording situation, I think, and work with a good engineer as well. Because a lot of the time doing everything yourself is a tough one on your perspective of what you're doing, you know. So um, I'm, I'm looking to hold hands with people a bit more, you know. Yeah, to be a bit more held in the yeah. process. Yeah, yeah and I think, you know, I don't, I've got nothing to prove, you know, I've got, I can just 
you know, just lean back into that a little bit more now. Fantastic. Cool. Well, happy onwards journeys in yeah. music. And Thank um, yeah, thanks a lot for your time today. Thank you for listening and be sure to check out the show notes for further information as well as links and details of other episodes in the Electronic Music series. And just before you go, let me point you to soundonsound.com forward slash podcasts so you can check out what's on our other channels. This has been a Caro C production for Sound on Sound. <laughs>